Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, this is our holocast, a combination of a podcast and a hologram. And today we have with us uh, Dave Williams, as also known as Astro Dave. Dave, welcome uh, to our program. Thanks so much for having me, Fernando. It's incredible being able to connect and chat using technology like this. It's almost like I'm in the room with you. Amen. Hey, Dave, um, I know you, and you are a rising star, but some people may not know you as an astronaut, as uh, the director of the Human Health Performance in NASA. Can you please tell me more about who is Dave Williams? Sure. So I grew up in Canada and uh, wanted to be an astronaut when uh, I was a young child in the 1960s. And I was seven years old when Alan Schur lifted off to go into space. And I said, that's what I wanted to do. I uh, think it would be absolutely incredible to fly in space. Fast forward many years, I went through university, ultimately became an emergency trauma physician. I was working in 1990. Two, Canada put out a request for applications to become an astronaut. So I was very lucky to join the space program. They hired four people, myself, Chris Hadfield, Julie Payette, and Mike McKay. And I came to Houston to start training in 1995, flew my first space flight in 1998, and then became director of what was then known as Space and Life Sciences, which is now known as Human Health and Performance. Did that for four years and was reassigned to fly my second flight, which took place in 2007. Wow, that's an amazing career. Um, tell me about <laughs> your experience in space. Um, what do you feel? What, if you need to mention the three most important aspects of your mission, what would you say to our audience? You know, being in space is an incredible experience, both as a human, where you get to see the planet from such a unique perspective and realize that there's no borders separating countries that we can see from space. We're all in this together in our global village. But more importantly, the absence of gravity, this unique microgravity environment, enables us to do a whole range of science that we're not really able to do here on Earth. In fact, my first space shuttle mission in 1998 was called Neurolab, dedicated to understanding how the brain and nervous system adapted to being in space. And we did a wide range of experiments from investigators all over the world who are some of the best neuroscientists in the world to see how the brain adapted to functioning in this unique environment. My second space flight, totally different experience. I went from being a researcher in space to essentially being a construction worker helping build the space station. I did three spacewalks and was very very lucky to set the Canadian record for spacewalking, but uh, worked uh, very much outside the space station installing the S5 segment on the space station, working on the end of the Canada arm to change out one of the gyroscopes, was not working properly on the space station, and doing a whole host of maintenance tasks as well. Amazing. But also, um, you help to train and perform a mission to another Canadian astronaut, which was the first commercial astronaut in human history during the mix, mission AX-1. Is that right? Yes, I, I had retired from the space program in 2008, but continued working in the aerospace sector, both as a consultant and uh, giving talks, writing books and all these things. And very fortunately, the company that I'm involved with right now called Leap Biosystems integrated the payload for the Canadian astronaut that was part of the AX-1 space flight. And that unique historical first, the first commercial space flight to go and use the facilities, the capabilities of the International Space Station to do research in space. In this case, research that was supported by private uh, funding through academic institutions, very similar to what we would do in the space program. It was a remarkable experience, and we did a historic first. For the first time in history, the team demonstrated a two-way whole connection with the International Space Station. So when I say the team, it was your team, the exit team, working together with Leap Biosystems, Axiom, and the crew, and NASA all working together to make this happen. It was a remarkable experience. And you were one of the first holonauts with Mark Patti. I, as I remember, you holoported to the space station from mission control at the same time that Mark Patti holoported from station to ground. 
doing the first off-planet two-way holographic teleportation in human history, right? Yeah, so that was pretty exciting being part of that first two-way hull of connection with space. You know, it reminded me very much of beam up in Star Trek. One minute I'm in mission control in Houston, and then within about 15 seconds or so, I'm on board the U.S. lab on the International Space Station. I like to joke and say it was my my fastest trip ever to the US lab. Normally, you know, on a spacecraft it takes you a day of launch and then you got a rendezvous and dock and then you got to transfer uh, you know through the hatch and get on the space station. Here I was there in seconds. It was incredible. Wow, amazing. And also you have a company, you are developing medical solutions as well with your team at Lee Biotechnologies, right? Yeah, we have a, a company that I'm working with right now called Leap Biosystems, and there's four other founders, a uh, total of five founders, and I'm really the CEO of Leap Biosystems, and I'm really thrilled to be working with an amazing group of individuals, all of whom made it to the finals in the last Canadian astronaut selection. So these are incredible individuals who would do really well astronauts in space, but I get to work with them on a daily basis here on Earth, developing augmented reality solutions for remote medical care. So whether it's healthcare in space, on the surface of the moon, or ultimately on Mars, or whether it's healthcare in remote parts of Canada and other parts of the world, we're developing augmented reality solutions that will help in those environments. And we're thrilled to be able to do it collaborating with IEXA. And I think that's one of the things it's important of the future. It's really a lesson from the space station, working together to sometimes take on these impossible objectives and make the impossible possible. Of course. And talking about that, um, you told me once about the story that um, you had cancer and then you lost your license as a pilot and as an astronaut, uh, but you figure out your way to succeed and come back. Can you please uh, tell us about your story, please? Well, you know, in many ways, my story medically is a reflection of our commitment in healthcare to developing new technologies to help people in their times of need and be able to treat a wide range of diseases. So I was uh, 50 years old, and uh, between my first and my second space flight, I'd been assigned to STS 118 already. We were busy doing spacewalk training and I uh, was also participating in some underwater missions to the Aquarius undersea research habitat. In fact, I was scheduled to be the commander of the NEMO 7 underwater mission and I was diagnosed with cancer. So that was a tough time. And when you hear those words, you have cancer, you join a club that nobody wants to be in. You know, I kind of call this the cancer club and absolutely nobody wants to be part of that whole thing. But when you you hear those words, you realize that your life is going to be different. I lost all my medicals, um, went for surgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, had a fantastic surgeon, recovered from that, went back to Johnson Space Center and worked with my um, astronaut strength and rehabilitation coaches, got back into shape and got my medical back to be able to go fly in space. In fact, I recovered quick enough where I considered actually being the commander of NEMO 7 and uh, thought about it. We had a medical board and I said, you know, it's probably best for me to still continue to recover. So in 2006, I went on to become the commander of NEMO 9, an 18-day underwater mission. And then in 2007, I flew on the mission STS-118, did three spacewalks as a cancer survivor. And it's a real testimony to the space medicine program that we have uh, within the space agency. Amazing story of recovery after losing a lot and just come back in no time and ready for your next mission. Uh, Dave, as astronaut, physician, businessman, mentor, uh, what will you say are your biggest three achievements in life that you will say, okay, you have a lot of books. I love your books. You, I have copies of your books. Uh, but what will you say are your biggest three achievements until today? I think, first of all, uh, having a remarkable family. You know, my wife and I have been together for well over 40 years. Uh, I've got uh, three children. It's just uh, absolutely fantastic. Having a family that supports you when you're traveling in space and living underwater and doing all these other risky endeavors. You know, I, often people say I could never be an astronaut because uh, I'm not willing to accept that risk. 
Well, in fact, I think the people who are truly courageous are not just the astronauts. It's the family members who see their loved ones going off and doing these things and hope and pray that they're going to come back safely. So I think that would be one of them. The second would be becoming a physician. And uh, that's a 12-year journey at McGill University. I did my undergraduate there, did a master's degree in neuroscience, then went on to become a physician, in particular an emergency trauma physician. And I think if we're sending doctors to space, you know, an emergency physician, arguably ER docs have the whole skill set that we need to be able to deliver microgravity medicine. So I was just really lucky to be in that position and uh, fly both as an astronaut not also fly as a uh, physician as well and be a crew medical officer on both of my missions in space. And then, of course, the last would be becoming an astronaut. And uh, it's an absolutely incredible job. Really the most amazing thing I've ever done in life is be able to fly in space and help build the space station, do three spacewalks and study, do research and develop protocols to diagnose and treat medical illness in space. And that's an absolutely incredible uh, capability that we're going to be continuing to develop as we send humans back to the moon and continue to develop further that autonomous healthcare we'll need to have humans safely voyage to Mars. Uh, Dave, this is one of our first Holocaust. This is going to be better and better, but people may be watching this in 10, 20 years from now. What will be your message for that future generation watching you and your story of success as an astronaut, as a physician, as a businessman, as a, a father, a husband? What will be your message if somebody is watching this in 20 years? You know, I think... Probably one of the take-home messages from my perspective is learning how to manage risk. And uh, arguably, as an innovator in business, as for contemplating developing technologies, we're not going to succeed all the time. We actually are going to fail in some situations, learn from that failure, how to be able to make something better, more marketable, a stronger piece of technology, and then bring it back and try and so understanding all the different factors associated with managing risk is a critical element of my life as a doctor, as an emergency physician, understanding and controlling the risks in optimizing patient care, safety and quality in the delivery of that care. Certainly as an astronaut, learning to identify risk, to be able to develop controls to mitigate that risk and manage that risk is absolutely critical. And then, you, you know, as well as I, developing new technologies. You know, we're speaking together on the what we might call the first generation of Holo Connection technology. In 20 to 30 years, Holo Connection will be something that we probably take for granted and very much like science fiction beam me up technology technology that we saw in Star Trek in the 1960s, 60 years ago. Absolutely incredible to think of that. So I love to say, let's get rid of the letters I am out of the word possible and make the possible possible and ask the question under what circumstances might whatever we're trying to do be possible. Amen for that. Well, Dave, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know that you're always busy innovating, helping people creating the next episode in space exploration and space medicine. But it was a huge honor to have you here, and hopefully we can have you again, Dave. Thank you so much for your time. Yes. Well, thanks very much for having me.